In this video, I'm going to run through questions 5 to 7 of the AQA GCC Combined Science Trilogy Physics Paper 2 on the higher tier. I hope you find it useful. In the first question, it says the car aerial receives radio waves from a radio transmitter. Radio waves are transverse waves and sound waves are longitudinal waves. It wants to describe the difference between transverse waves and longitudinal waves. So I've now uploaded the model answer for this question. The example we're expecting you to write. You can see that you get the first map talking about longitudinal waves, and you need to say that their oscillations or vibrations are parallel to the direction of energy transfer. You are allowed the, the word direction of motion instead of energy transfer there. For the second mark, you need to talk about transverse waves, and the idea for transverse waves is that their oscillations or vibrations are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. Now we get the second mark for that question. The next part of the question, question 5.2, says the radio waves have a frequency of 4.8 um, hertz. So we can highlight that there, 4.8 hertz. And they have a wave speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. It wants you to calculate the wavelength of the radio waves, and it also wants you to give you your answer to two significant figures. So you can see you've got three marks here. The first thing you need to do is remember the equation that links um, wave speed, wavelength, and frequency. And that's wave speed is equal to wavelength times frequency. So you can see here that I've put the equation on, so wave speed is equal to wavelength times frequency. The next part of the question is to substitute the numbers in. With my highlighting, you can see that we're just going to put 3 times 10 to the 8 in for wave speed and 4.8 times 10 to the 9 in for frequency. We'll rearrange them to find what wavelength is. So this part of the question, as you can see, I'll substitute the numbers in. We get the mark for doing this by saying that 3 times 10 to the 8 is equal to wavelength times 4.8 times 10 to the 9. Now, I rearrange by taking the 4.8 times 10 to the 9 to the other side of the equation. So I do 3 times 78 over 4.8 times 10 to the 9 is equal to my wavelength. If I put that into my calculator, it will give me the correct answer. As you can see, the next mark we get for the, uh, the, the rearrangement of the equation, which we've got here, <coughs> we get the correct mark for getting a, a, a 6.3 times 10 to the minus 2 for two significant figures. If you've not got a number of two significant figures, you'll only get two marks for this question. Question 5.3 says, describe how the radio waves reaching the car radio produce signals in the electrical circuits of the car radio. It's a three mark question. So the mark scheme gives us these answers here. We can have three marks for any of the three of the following four answers. We get a maximum of three. So in terms of the questions that you could get, uh, the answers you could get here, the idea is that the car aerial absorbs radio waves or energy from the radio waves, would be one mark. Electrons are made to vibrate in the aerial. Those vibrations then form an alternating current, and the signal frequency is the same as the radio wave. As a final point, so in terms of how that works, it's just talking through that process there, the idea that the the car aerial absorbs the energy from the radio waves that causes electrons to vibrate, that creates the alternating current, and the alternating current will have the same frequency as the radio wave that produced it. So that brings us to the end of question five. Please give yourself a score out of eight and get ready to move on to the next question. Question 6.1 is figure eight shows the distance time graph of a car traveling at 15 meters per second. When the driver is tired, his reaction time increases from 0.5 seconds to 0.82 seconds. It wants you then to determine the extra distance the car would travel before driver starts braking. So what we need to do first of all is to use the graph to try and find out when these two events take place. So you can see the first bit is at 0 0.5, so if we highlight that there, 0 0.5 into the time, that will intersect the y-axis at that point there, which is nice and clear, and it's 7.5 metres. The next bit that we're going to look at is the um, is what happens at 8.2. So we go up to 8.2, we can see going up here, you can see that intersects there. If we take that one across, you can see where 8.2 and 6 line is directly in between um, 12 and 12.5, so we'll call that 12.3 or 12.25. So we've read those two values off now, and now all we need to do is determine the extra distance the car would travel. So he's going from 7.5 to 12.3, so if we do 12.3 minus 7.5, we'll get the correct answer here. So you can see that like, we, get, we do 12.3 minus 7.5, and we get the correct answer out to be 4.8. One mark for 12.3 minus 7.5, and one mark for 4.8. So in terms of the marking criteria here, it's one mark for reading them correctly from the graph, and the other mark for um, <coughs> doing the calculation correctly. 
The next part of question 6.2 says when the brakes are used, the temperature of the brakes increases. It wants you to explain why and use ideas about energy in your explanation. So you can see that I've put the, um, the mark scheme up for this question on the board. And what you get there is that it says that it, there is a decrease in kinetic energy of the car. So when the car's moving, it's got high kinetic energy. Obviously, when you try and slow it down, it's kinetic energy decreases. So you get one mark for saying a decrease in kinetic energy. Where's that energy, where's that energy transferred to? That causes the internal energy or the thermal energy store of the brakes to increase. That would be the second mark. You could also get a mark here for work done to overcome friction, um, being releases heat but mainly the example I would like you to answer it in this way. Question 6.3 says, a lorry travels at 84 meters with a constant acceleration of two meters per second to reach a velocity of 19 meters per second. It would like you to calculate the initial velocity of the lorry. I would like you to do that using the physics equation sheet. So if you look on the equation sheet, you'll come up with this equation here, which you want to use, which is V squared minus U squared is equal to two multiplied by A multiplied by S. So V is your final velocity, U is your initial velocity, uh, 2 is just obviously the number 2, you get A is for acceleration and S is for displacement or distance. It wants you to calculate the initial velocity, and we're just going to go through and highlight the things that we might, might want to use in terms of the question now. So if we look at the first bit, we've got a velocity of 19 metres per second, so that's the one that it reaches, so that's going to be our final velocity there. We've got the idea that the lorry travels a distance of 84 metres, so that's going to be our displacement. And we've also got that it's got a constant acceleration of 2 metres per second squared, and that will be our acceleration. So you can substitute those numbers into the equation now, and then rearrange. So in substituting the numbers in, we can get ourselves the first mark, which is for writing 19 squared is equal to u squared. Uh, so 19 squared minus u squared equals 2 times 2 times 84. We now just need to rearrange, and then we need to get the correct answer. So now we're doing 19 squared, we get the answer. Um, we get that out to be 361. So we've got 361 minus u squared. If we do 2 times 2 times 84, we get 336. Now what we need to do is we need to take u to the other side, because the moment is minus. So we'd have to add u over here, and then we're going to have to subtract the 336 from the other side. So now I hope we can follow through my working that I've put on here. We started off with 361 minus u squared equals 336. So we added the u squared to this side. So you've got 361 is, is equal to 30, 336 plus u squared. So we now subtract the 336. So we get 361 minus 336 equals u squared. We do 361 minus 336 gives us 25. That's equal to u squared. We square root um, the 25 to get u by itself. And we get that u is equal to 5. So in terms of the marking criteria here, you get the first mark, as I've said before, for putting the numbers into the equation. You get a second mark for rearranging and, and then doing the square root. So anything that was, was like this mark here or that mark there would have been the third mark. And the final mark is for getting the fact that it's 5 at the end. Obviously, if you've got u to be 5, you get all three marks. In this question, you ask to describe the relationship shown in figure 9. You should include factors that would affect the gradient of the lines. So I'll just get figure 9 onto the screen for you. So I've got figure 9 onto the screen, and you can see that it's a graph showing distance in metres against speed in kilometres an hour. But it's also got a key, um, which is, contains uh, thinking distance, braking distance, and stopping distance. So in terms of the structure of our report, we are going to have to discuss about stopping distance, braking distance, and thinking distance. And we also need to explain why it is that the, the factors affect the gradient of the lines. So what sort of things will affect those lines um, and, and how do we, will they make them steeper or more shallow? So on the screen now, the sort of things you need to be talking about, you can see that I've colour coded them. At the top we've got um, the red responding to thinking distance. You can see that the things that we need to talk about there are the use of drug and alcohol, time and distraction will all increase thinking distance. Thinking distance increases with speed. And the thinking distance is directly proportional to speed, and the reason for that is that you're not braking, so you're going at a constant speed there. Um, and if you were to use drugs, alcohol, or you're tired or you're distracted, that would increase the gradient of thinking distance. In terms of braking distance, poor brakes, poor tyres, wet or icy roads, and mass would increase the braking distance. Braking distance also increases with speed, um, and braking distance increases an increasing rate, so the gradient gets steep, which is why it curves upwards. 
And the reason for that is that it isn't a linear relationship because you are slowing down that causes this line to go up. Okay. Um, it then wants you to do, go on to say, poor brakes, poor tyres, what's the right of roads with me an increasing gradient. Um, and actually in this case, you should know from maths that a, a curved line like that is actually equal to, um, is when y equals x squared. So when it curves upwards like that, you, that graph is showing that y equals x squared, which means that in this case, distance is equal to v squared. As we saw in the equation, v squared minus g squared is equal to 2as. It actually still talk about stopping distance, and here you're ready to be writing that stopping distance is equal to thinking distance plus breaking distance, and factors that increase either thinking or breaking would impact and increase stopping distance. And stopping distance increases at an increasing rate with speed, and again, you know, stopping distance you can see here has <coughs> got that curve effect as well. So please use this to improve your answer, um, and... I would really recommend getting a teacher to check this work for you just to make sure that you, you've given yourself the correct mark for this question. That brings us to the end of this question, so please give yourself an overall mark for it before we move on to the final question of the paper. In question 7, you're given figure 10 shows the horizontal force like a man swimming in the sea. Question 7.1 says describe the movement of the man when the resultant horizontal force is 0 newtons. So he's swimming along, it says he's swimming already. If the resultant force is zero newtons, then he will not be accelerating so the forces are balanced. So you'll continue to swim at a constant speed. So you see now the correct answer to this question will be constant velocity. And the reason for that is that there's no overall resultant force. So that the man's uh, velocity or speed does not change. In question 7.2, it says the man increases force A. Explain what happens to force B and to the movement of the man. The first thing that will happen is as force A increases, is the man the resultant force will become unbalanced, so the man will begin to increase his speed. So he'll accelerate forwards. After he's accelerated forwards, he's going to be colliding with more water molecules in a given time, which is going to increase the size of force B. So the man will accelerate forwards, but as he accelerates forwards, force B will increase. Force B will continue to increase until the point at which force B is equal to force A. At that point, the man will continue to swim at a new, higher, constant velocity. So here you can see the marking points. The first mark we get for saying the swimmer accelerates. As the swimmer accelerates, force B will begin to increase as the second mark. The third mark comes from saying that force B will increase until it's equal to force A. And the final bit, or the final mark, the fourth mark for this question is saying that when force B is equal to force A, the man will swim at a higher, constant velocity. That's how you get all four marks for that question. So now on the final question of the paper, it says a boat moves through the sea. There's a 3,000 newton force to the west on the boat, and there's a 1,000 newton force to the south on the boat. It wants you to determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant force on the boat. And to do that, it wants you to draw a vector diagram of these forces to scale in figure 11. <coughs> so you can see here we've got the, um, the graph paper. It wants us to draw these to scale. So what we need to really decide on then is what sizes our forces should be. So the f force acting south is 1,000 newtons and the force acting uh, west is 3,000. So I would probably use two small squares uh, to be 1,000 newtons. And we'll see how we go from there. So now I've drawn the force um, triangles on here. So you can see this one here. I would use two squares to make the 1,000 newton force keeping the idea that two small squares is 1,000 newtons. I'd then use my one going to the west, which is 3,000 newtons, and I've taken six squares to put that in. And then I've finally drawn, joined that up with my resultant force, which I'm going to try and measure. I've drawn that in red. Notice that I've put the arrows on all of them, and by drawing that as I have done there, I mean, set up that way, you would get yourself the first mark for this question. So now all we need to do is measure the length of this this side here and use the correct scale to convert it and if you do that correctly you get an answer of so if you measure that you get an angle uh, an answer for the magnitude to be between 3100 newtons and 3200 newtons so any answer in there will get you the second mark for question and the final mark is achieved for measuring the angle between the horizontal that line there and your resultant force there and if you measure that angle you should get that angle to come out to be between 17 to 19 degrees, and that will get you your uh, 
Your third and final modifier question. Question 7.4 says the force on the sound the sound for the boat increases. What effect does this have on the resultant force on the boat? So if the um force acting southwards increases, then the boat's gonna move towards the south, and it's gonna accelerate in that direction. So here you can see the answer to that question now is the idea the first bit we'll be getting the mark for saying the resultant force will increase. And then the second model will be saying that the direction of the boat will change towards the south because the increase has been into the south. Now you show you the final two marks on the paper. So please give yourself a mark out of 10 for question 7. We've now finished going through the paper. I hope you found it useful and um, I'll see you next time.